Marcus, and Marcus, thank you very much, uh, however spelled, for those kind introductions. And I must say, speaking for myself and I'm sure for everybody else, this is uh, absolutely wonderful to be back here. I have many happy memories of this auditorium in particular. Um, and also all kinds of Bell Labs. I did spend over 30 years here, had a great time with an infinite number of good colleagues, many of whom I see here. Some of you slightly more gray-haired than you used to be, but okay, that's all right. I mean, so it's absolutely wonderful, and I'm really grateful to the folks at uh, Nokia Bell Labs for putting this event together after 50 years. It's a great deal. Um, so, the panel has an incredibly vague charter, the origin of Unix. Okay, so we, what we're gonna do is talk about that, but we have here four people who actually know something about the topic, uh, different things perhaps. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is ask each of them to talk for roughly five minutes uh, on whatever they wanna say ab about that. Uh, and then at the end, we get a chance to let you folks ask some questions, although I can't see anybody because the lights are too bright. Um, <laughs> And that's what we'll do. So, um, Doug McElroy, who is there, uh, the creator of any number of core tools that you've probably used if you've ever used Unix. And I think in all seriousness, without whose technical and managerial excellence of judgment, Unix might not have happened. So, uh, Doug will be first. Um, I guess second is uh, John Bentley, uh, who's an insightful critic of all kinds of things, uh, on writing in particular, an expert on algorithms, a wonderful person for conveying the uh, essence of important things through things like his Programming Pearls books, and a pollinator of ideas, the kind of person who wandered around talking from one person and then another passing interesting and good ideas uh, around. Uh, Steve Johnson on the far end, creator of language tools without whom I would not have been able to do many of the things that I did. Uh, the creator of the portable C compiler that made it possible to move Unix to other operating, to other uh, hardware platforms that, as Marcus with a C mentioned, um, including the port of Unix to the Interdata 832 that was done with uh, Dennis Ritchie. And then finally, um, to my immediate right, Peter Weinberger is certainly the best known face in the group. Uh, who, who, uh, That's enough, isn't it? He, <laughs> uh, uh, with uh, Al Ajo and uh, Peter, we created Auk in the late 1970s. Peter did remote file systems, database software, and he was in fact um, executive director of the area just before the great vestiture of 1996. So um, all of us have lots of memories, uh, lots of insights. None of these folks have ever been very shy about expressing their opinions, quite the contrary. So I'm just gonna leave it to them to speak for themselves, okay? So uh, let's start with Doug. Let me, let me begin with a, a shout out for TUHS, the mailing list of the Unix Historical Society. Assuming that you're here because you're interested in Unix over all time, uh, that's a place to go to just to keep up to date and you'll find out much more interesting things that I can tell you about the history of Unix because world, it extends worldwide. Uh, the, I won't, I, my assignment was to talk about how Unix came to be and versions and all that sort of stuff, but probably everybody knows all of that. Be, uh, it has been written about by Dennis Ritchie much better than I could. Uh, so I will just try to find a few incidents that illustrate what happened in the wonderful Unix room or rooms. Uh, Unix, of course, was born out of the ashes of Multics which was the third big operating system that had been worked on here at Bell Labs. The other two had been written by a, never more than a handful of people. Multix was at least 80 people, 10 of whom came from Bell Labs and stretched all the way across the country from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Phoenix, Arizona. And in five years didn't manage to produce a working operating system. But it did produce some good ideas and some people in the back room, notably Ken Dennis and Rudd Kennedy, were thinking about how they might be able to do it better with uh, 
with a little bit less uh, uh, of a design effort. Multics had a five foot shelf. At one point when uh, folks in AT&T IT department were wanting to buy a Vax, they commissioned a professor at Harvard who obviously was very good at getting such commissions to tell why it would be better to use DEX operating system than our operating system. And his response essentially was, well, DEX is made by mature operating system developers. <laughs> and furthermore, its shelf of manuals is to, a measure of this maturity is its shelf of manuals is two feet long and Unix's is only two inches. Uh, that apparently pleased the, the folks at AT&T headquarters, uh, all except for the president's office. The president's office uh, had a different idea. Charlie Brown was a little bit vain about appearing in public wearing glasses. And his PR people heard that we had a photo typesetter and wondered, could we uh, set type for Charlie Brown's speeches in large type? <laughs> well, sure, we could do that. And it doesn't help, doesn't hurt. For the little extra effort it would cost us, we would have an in in the CEO, CEO's office. <laughs> so we did it. Uh, various adventures happened, like such as once when Charlie was a little late with his uh, speech planning, they sent out a helicopter to land on Bell Labs lawn and take our printout back. <laughs> Do remember that. Uh, another time, I found that they had decided that this, the access to our machine was good for something other than speech writing, and we're maintaining the uh, minutes of the AT&T board on our computer, a computer where everybody had super user privilege, <laughs> and probably the most visible computer available by dial-up in the world. <laughs> Fortunately, the minutes are very noncommittal. <laughs> Wise plan. You don't know what they talked about. All you know is what they decided. Anyway, I, I did call the PR uh, vice president and say, I think it would be a good idea if you got the board minutes off our machine. Uh, and consequently, Unix, a special Unix was installed in the CEO's office. Not bad. Uh, there were several themes that, prevail, that prevailed in the Unix room. By the way, tell me how I'm, tell me, cut me off at any time. <laughs> I, I'm not keeping score here. I have no <laughs> idea. Uh, I, uh, one is text processing. When we were, when Joe Osana, Ken Thompson in particular, were searching for a new computer to do operating system research on, higher management said, we were burned on Multics. It's not a good idea. They suggested PDP-10s from DEC as a cheaper, but still expensive and mainframe kind of machine. Finally, when the PDP-11 came out, brilliant idea. We'll, the fig leaf is that we'll make a word processing, processing system that can be used in Bell Labs typing pools and secretaries' offices. But to do that, we, uh, we can't build that unless we have our own operating system. We'll use that to create a word processing system. That plus a, a little help from our, our friends in visual and acoustics research who had some spare money at the end of the year bought a PDP-11, and from there on, it's history. But text processing was to be a theme through the whole life of, of the Unix lab. Uh, 
and notably the phototype setter. We've al already told one story about it. When the phototype setter appeared, uh, the, the, there was an explosion of people making the most gorgeous and creative outputs. Fortunately, Mike Lesk came along later on and said, you know, let's make good-looking outputs all the same, My, the MS facility. And uh, the uh, creativity stopped, and it was a good idea. <laughs> uh, but the first manuscript that was sent out of that laboratory resulted in a response from the publisher, are you sure, uh, from the journal, are you sure this hasn't been published somewhere else already? <laughs> yes, we were sure. Hey, Doug, uh, should we pause temporarily and move on to someone else? For that's time? fine. OK, yeah. OK, I think uh, John was next in the rotation. Uh, Doug began with his shout out uh, to the Unix Historical Society. Uh, I'll give my shout out to a wonderful new book. You can grep for it at Amazon if you grew up for uh, Kernahan Unix memoir. Uh, I've spent much of the last uh, summer reading various versions of it. It was a great way to page back in those things. Uh, allegedly, my copy should be arriving uh, this afternoon. They're just, they're, they're, they are hot off the press. Uh, you too should get some. And in addition to my shout out, I will give my curse uh, to the same uh, young Brian Kernahan who placed me after Doug McElroy, the very worst place to be in any uh, speaking order. Uh, my task was to talk about the Unix community. Uh, it flourished in many parts of Building 2. Uh, the Holy of Holies was, of course, the Unix room. But even more important for many people was the lunch table. Uh, the Unix room denizens left promptly at 1 for their lunch table. Uh, the rest of us left around uh, 11 o'clock for ours. Sometimes we would join 1138 uh, at 11.30. The math people had theirs at 12. Sometimes we had chemists. We had uh, physicists, uh, outside developers come here. That was a big part of the community. Uh, after the lunch table, we had a walk. Uh, on, on nice days like this. There used to be wonderful berries around the back of the building. Uh, Al Aho, in addition to many things, is a marvelous um, uh, berry picker. That he uh, knew, knew where all the great berries were. Uh, delightful walks. Uh, all topics were fair game. Early ideas for a new theorem. Questions about a program. Interesting new technical paper. Local dining, politics, anything. The lunch table was where many of us had the biggest slice of our Unix community. Brian mentioned that I wrote a book and a columns called Programming Pearls. I did that precisely because there were software gems scattered throughout 1127 and Bell Labs, and the community delighted in sharing them. Ken Thompson's chess game analysis, Doug McElroy's spell checker, Bob Morris's tiny counters, Norm Schreier's floating point tests, Vic Vysoski's memos on software, Rob Pike and Bart Lucanthes, Wicked Fast Bitblit, John Litterman's Sort, the list goes on and on. After I had stolen a good idea, came the very hard work of putting it into writing. Looking back, one can view Center 1127 as a writing school that did a little programming on the side. Every piece that I wrote was torn to shreds and then reassembled by 1127 colleagues. Comments ranged from subtle bugs and errant words to suggestions for completely rebuilding text and code. I learned to write from people on this stage, especially Doug McElroy, and from others, including Al Aho, Dennis Ritchie, Ravi Sethi, and David Johnson. 50 years have passed. The friendships remain. It's great to be back here as part of the Unix community and the Bell Labs community. Thanks for having us. Steve. Well, I just remember the time working with these folks is an extremely happy time. You know, it, you never knew what was going to happen when you walked into the Unix room, but it was always good. Um, and it was also a time when I had two kids at home, aged one and three, so I was sleep deprived, and um, I got a terminal at home. It was incredibly wonderful. 
Now, I, of course, I had to haul a box of fanfold paper home about every two weeks. And occasionally, we had some glitches, such as the time the cat decided to use the fanfold box as a litter box. <laughs> um, but it was, it was just remarkable. And the sense of working on something that was going to be, you know, wouldn't really come to fruition for five or 10 years was, was quite exhilarating. I think we all believed that. But day to day, it was just wonderful. Uh, I came to the Unix group a little bit differently than other folks. Uh, I actually had been an intern for three, three summers before coming to work permanently. And I was in the human information processing division and, and uh, you know, wrote papers on cluster analysis and that kind of thing. But I also used the computer a lot. And the computer center was hurting because it was being run by researchers. And uh, a lot of the users were getting pretty irritated at the way that things weren't going as well as they could. <coughs> And I've always believed that computer science is a service profession. And uh, that if the customers, if you will, of what you're doing aren't happy, you have, you have not succeeded. So I accepted a uh, job helping to run the computer center. And uh, this was actually somewhat encouraged by the fact that my previous organization had run out of computer money in October the previous year, and we were told to, quote, put our work on Firm. a, uh, a firmer intellectual footing, okay, until January 1st. <laughs> so I decided to go where the source of the cycles were. Uh, and that, uh, that same impulse led me to, to leave the research group and go over to the development organization that was building system five, uh, partly because I knew we had these gold nuggets coming out of research and they weren't going to get out if somebody didn't do that. And so I did. And so we produced the first commercial C++ compiler and completely rewrote the debugger, which uh, meant that we could handle languages like Ada and what have you. And another aspect of the spread of Unix which is what well, I think was very powerful was the organization Usenix. Uh, I ended up as the Bell Labs, if you will, representative on the Usenix board, uh, and recommended by Dennis actually, who wanted nothing to do with it. And the great thing about Usenix in those days was that the conferences were roughly 50% industry and 50% academic. And that was just an incredibly rich environment. You know, so the problems people were having and the issues and the things they wanted were just face to face with the people who could address them. Uh, and I, I and, and Usenix did a lot of wonderful things. We, we basically financed the first ISP, for example, uh, and uh, did a great deal to make uh, system administration into a real discipline as opposed to just somebody coming in and doing file dumps at three in the morning. Uh, I think I could go on for hours, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Peter. Uh, Clean up, Peter. How much time do I have, more or less? <laughs> I will watch, there's a countdown clock. I will pay no attention to Ooh. it. They, they, so I was going to talk about what we got right and what we got wrong, and I have a, a sort of fairly technical discussion, but maybe I won't give all of it, because I realized that when I was thinking about it, I was in the mental state of, if it were 1985, knowing what I know now, what would I think we should be working on? What, what did I think we had gotten right? And it's not 1985, right? So maybe that's not exactly the right thing to talk about, but I, I'm going to give a couple of sort of what I think are, are technically significant things with a slightly historical uh, slant. So one of the things that Unix got right, and everybody knows it, is thinking of files as just streams of bytes. 
And when you think about it nowadays, you say to yourself, well, what they were doing was they, you know, there's files like this and files like that and files like this, and the lowest common denominator is bytes, so that's a good choice. That's not what was going on in 1969. In 1969, when you wrote disks or you wrote tapes, you decided what your record structure looked like. Right? The IBM disks at those times, although you had to fit in one track, you might ask what's a track, but we don't care, is um, <laughs> right, you got to decide how long the records you wrote in that track were. So it's an actually the idea of using a raw stream of bytes as an abstraction and quite a valuable one. The other two things I'm going to mention briefly, since I've now slipped into what I wasn't going to do, is um, the uh, as fork and exec, which produces this unbounded tree of processes. Okay, I'm not saying it was original, but the idea that you have this unbounded collection, this unbounded evanescent tree of processors, is, is quite different from the way a lot of systems at that time ran, where there was some fixed collection of task slots that you, fit, you, you sort of signed up for and put in. And if you have this giant tree, you need some form of inter-process communication. And the cleverness, I think, one of the clevernesses of people who made this decision, all of these decisions were made way before I got there, so it's OK, the, was, was to choose pipes, which are not the most general form of inter-process communication, but plenty useful. And I think the final thing I want to talk about on the good side is the hierarchical file system, which is so common now, it's hard to imagine what the alternatives were. But Back on those five-foot shells of manuals, there were lots of alternatives, and none of them were particularly satisfactory. The interesting thing about having a large hierarchical file system is you've got to name the stuff. Okay? And then you need some kind of, for utility and for people to use at the command line, some kind of pattern matching story. Right? And one of the things we never, I would say, got totally right is, is which form of pattern matching were we using where. I'd like to talk briefly about two things we got wrong. One thing we got wrong was networking, and I don't feel so bad about that because everyone's gotten that wrong. Okay, that's just, that to this day, things are not satisfactory. The other thing which I think with inhuman insight we might have gotten done better on is configuration. So in the good old days, an application was essentially an executable somewhere. And a lot of the applications come with ancillary files, and some fraction of them come with per user customization. And we had, I think, the insufficiently, we had, it was a good idea, but should have changed, to put stuff in dot files. So if you look on your, in your login directory now, right, there's some terrific collection of anonymous dot files that you can't figure out whether you're using or not. Well, you can sort of figure out if you've used them recently, but that's not the same as whether or not you need them. And upgrading or removing applications was very difficult. For some of the configuration stuff, Microsoft faced the same problem and did the registry. Uh, nice try, but no. Right? There's a among other issues, there's a naming problem. Okay. The people who came closest to getting this right is Apple, who decided that an application was really a directory with a bunch of, so you could put all the ancillary stuff there, and some parallel structure local to you, so for your own uh, configuration choices. But you can't fix the old unfortunate state Right, if you go to Linux or OS X and click on an icon, that command sees a different environment than your command line stuff that runs in the shell. You can make them the same. That's a challenge for those of you who have nothing to do today. <laughs> so I think the number of things that, that it's not we, that they got right in the early things is really quite remarkable. And I just wish we had uh, seen the future more clearly. So apropos. <laughs> Apropos of the early file systems, in the GCOS uh, operating system, which was going on in 1969 and from which, um, where the PDP-7 Unix tapes were prepared, there was one very telling command. It was called futile, <laughs> spelled without an E. And that was, that was the magic of file systems. It had a thousand, oper a thousand different options. Uh, it just mind boggling. I remember the futile command, yes. <laughs> Do any members of this August group wish to comment or react to others as Doug just did? Um, otherwise? I didn't hear the question, sorry. Uh, any reaction? Any reaction? Comment on any of the other? 
Right, the question is, did any of us get it wrong? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, guess I, we all did. I just didn't. That's fine. I'm happy to talk about the comm center, however, because uh, that was one of the things that I did was to go, uh, when I was in the comm center, was to join a users group. And uh, I think I was about 19, maybe, or 20 at that point. And I went off to my first big business meeting, which was out in somewhere in the Midwest. And, uh, and this guy comes up to me from the from, uh, GE, it was then, and says, let me buy you a drink. OK, and I'm like, <laughs> what do I do with this? Uh, it was remarkable. I mean, at those days, the computers were $10 million. And they came with two or three employees of the computer company. OK? And our job was to suggest improvements. For example, when you turn the power on on the computer, and it comes up and says, init, question mark, OK? You should do, say, no, because if you say yes, it will wipe out What's the that? entire file system. <laughs> So we respectfully requested that they change that message to read, do you want to write, out, write all over the file system? And they did. Um, the, the, the model of a central computation center was already beginning to look kind of difficult. Um, I mean, it was not only the expense, but the, the monolithic nature of it. You really couldn't please more than a small fraction of the people that you needed to please. And uh, you know, it was, I think that it, it was clear to me, certainly, that Unix was the future, that having smaller machines that could be specialized and be stocked with exactly what a particular group needed uh, and be this sort of environment uh, to grow the stuff that the group needed. I think that was one of the most remarkable things for me is we had this motto that it, you know all the code is available to everybody, but if you touch it, you own it. And so what this did was cut down an incredible amount of uh, whining, maybe is the best way to describe it, about this or that feature that wasn't there. You know, it, it cut off all of those. And uh, the good news about that is that there are certain things that uh, I, I know both Mike Lesk and I had the experience of coming up with a wonderful piece of syntax and an absolutely appalling uh, implementation because we didn't really know how to implement it and only to find that somebody within two weeks had, you know, just cleaned it up remarkably. Uh, in my case, it was the at program, so that you could say at 5 a.m. and then just put a command line out there, and at 5 a.m. the machine would run it. And it was great. And then Dennis, I don't think I owned that program for more than a week. <laughs> and Dennis came in and made sure that the set UID bit was set properly, and it was in the right directory, and all this other stuff that I didn't even know enough to, to know I wasn't doing. And, and time and time again, uh, that happened. And it, it was incredibly fertile. And I could see it happening in all kinds of diverse groups in all kinds of diverse ways. So. Yeah, I'm, I suspect Marcus wants us to move on. Steve speaks to the community. And that's just an example of the sort of thing that John mentioned earlier, the fact that people worked on each other's code, improved it. It was a very open thing, it, perhaps a precursor of what we see with open source, but all done in a fairly small geographical area. So it was a great time.